Today's agenda, another topic in the readings in Philippine history. Customs of the Tagalogs by Fray Juan de Plasencia. Birth and family background. Fray Juan was born to the illustrious family of the Porto Carreros in Ex Plasencia in the region of Extremadura, Spain in the early 16th century. His father, Don Pedro Porto Carrero, was a captain of a Spanish schooner who died in Naples, Italy in 1574. Juan was one in a brood of seven. Having had a father who constantly plied the waters of the 16th century, Spanish domain in the Mediterranean Sea, which extended from the coast of the Iberian Peninsula to the ports of Naples, it was believed that the young Juan might have spent his early childhood in Italy. In fact, this brought about some speculations that he could have probably even joined the Italian conventuals in his later teens. Juan de Placencia upbringing was spent against the backdrop of the spiritual and religious resurgence affected by Spain's Siglo de Oro and the observant and the post-Cisneros reforms. This favorable ambience which had taken place even in his own region of Extremadura. The goal of this study was to discover a distinct, non-contradictory, and functional meaning for each Filipino term used in the Spanish accounts. The methodology had four stages. First, the original texts were examined and compared with all such Spanish terms, such as principales and exclavos. Remove second, the Spanish use of the Filipino terms during the first century of occupations was examined in the contemporary dictionaries, decrees, and correspondence. Third, the 16th century meanings of the Spanish terms in Spanish society were studied and their applicability to Filipino classes assessed. And finally, a synthesis was attempted which would resolve all contradictions by rec recourse to a sectional variations, the author's personal interest, and genuine anachronisms due to socio-economic changes during the second half of the 16th century. The results are presented below in two sections, one for Luzon and the other for the Visayas, for obvious reasons of differences in the terminologies themselves. Arrival in the Philippines Fray Juan de Placencia came together with the first batch of Franciscan missionaries in the Philippines. In the list of missionaries bound for the Philippine Islands, which was dispatched from the Casa de la Contratación of Seville, dated May 21, 1577, the name Fray Joan de Puerto Carrero del Convento de Villanueva de la Serena was mentioned. On May 31 of the same year, Fray Juan, with his other companions, left Seville for the port of San Quilar de Barameda, and on the night of the 24th of June, sailed for the high seas, they arrived in Mexico on the month of September. After staying here for about six months, they resumed their voyage on March 15, 1578, from the port of Acapulco, dropping anchor only for the much-needed supplies near the coast of Marianas or Ladrones Islands. After a brief respite, they sailed for the Philippines. Finally, the ship with Fray Juan de Placencia on board arrived at the port in Cavite, a few kilometers south of Manila, on the 2nd of July, 1578. Historical Background of the Source Customs of the Tagalogs by Fray Juan de Placencia was written within the context of its situation when he arrived in the Philippines. Only two months after their arrival in Manila, Fray Juan de Placencia and another confrere, Fray Diego de Oropresa, were already preaching around Laguna de Bay area and as far as Tayabas, the present um, Crescent province, converting souls to the Catholic faith. He also preached and founded these places in the present provinces of Bulacan and Rizal, and these were Tayabas, Kalilaya, Lokban, Mahaihai, Nagkarlang, Lilio, Pilia, Santa Cruz, Lumbang, Pangil, Siniluan, Morong, Antipolo, Taytay, and Maykawayan. The Social Classes The society was made up of three classes the nobles, composed of the Datu, and their families, 
Mahadlika or Maharlika, consisting of the freemen or the commoners, the alipin or the dependents, composed of the dependents, aliping na mamahay or aliping sa gigiler. Members of the nobility were addressed as either Gat or Lakan by the Tagalogs. Alipin or dependents acquired their status by inheritance, captivity, purchase, failure to settle debts, or by committing a crime. There were two kinds of dependents, aliping na mamahay or aliping sa gigilid. Dependents were not slaves, although they are classified as one. No distinction was made between them except that when the alcaldes mayores treated them as such, they did not distinguish between them. Since no distinction was made between a namamahay and a sagigiler, most of the Indians treated them the same. The alcaldes mayores put this into document in order to resolve it. Children of parents who are both maharlika remain as one throughout their life. If it happens that they should become a slave, is it through marriage? If these maharlikas had children with slaves, the children and their mothers become free. If maharlika had children by the slave of another, she was forced when pregnant to give her master half a gold or tile due to the risk of death and inability to labor during the pregnancy. Children of parents who are both maharlika remain as one throughout their life. If it happens that they should become a slave, is it through marriage? If these maharlikas had children with slaves, the children and their mothers become free. If maharlika had children by the slave of another, she was forced when pregnant to give her master half a gold to raise her debt in the village during labor during pregnancy. In such cases, half the child is free, meaning the father will support the child in case he did not support the child. It means he did not recognize the child, as in his in which case the child becomes a slave woolly. If a free woman had children by a slave, they were all free, provided she did not marry him, the slave. If two persons get married, the one is maharlika and the other one is a slave. Whether namamahay or sagigiler, the children were divided in this way. The first, whether the male or female, goes to the father, as did the third and the fifth. The second and the fourth and the sixth belong to the mother, and so on. In this manner, if the father is free, so are his children. If he were a slave, his children become one too. The same applies to the children who go to the mother, and etc. If there were no more than one child, he or she is half free and half slave. The only issue here is on the division of children, whether male or female. Those who become slaves belong to a life of servitude, whether namamahay or sagigiler. If there were an odd number of children, the child who is odd is half free and half slave. Fry Placentia did not say at what age this division came about. One of these two kinds of slaves, the sagigiler, could be sold, as well as their offspring, but not the namamahay, and their children nor the could be transferred as long as they are within the same village. The Maharlikas could not, after marriage, move from one village to another and from one barangay to another without paying a certain fine in gold as arranged among them. Fines for the Datu movement depend on the inclination of the various villages to which he will move, running from one to three gold tiles in the banque for the entire barangay. Failure to pay this fine may result to a war between these two barangays. This also applies to both men and women, except in cases where a man married a woman from another barangay. The children divided equally between the two barangays. As for inheritances, all legitimate children of parents inherited equally, except in cases where, a, where both the mother or the father may have shown partiality to any of their children. If a man had a child by one of his slaves and he had also legitimate children, the former does not inherit anything from their father. Apart from the legitimate children, if a father had sons by a free unmarried woman to whom a dowry was given, but she was not. But she was not considered as a real wife. All these were classified as natural sons. Therefore, they qualify as natural heirs, but only a third of the entire inheritance. If there were no legitimate children, the father who may have begotten a child by unmarried woman or in a sawa, they inherit in full. In administering justice, investigations made and sentences passed were done in the presence of his barangay members. In case where the litigants felt aggrieved, an arbiter was anonymously named from another village, whether 
were a datu or not if he's known to be fair and just in his decisions. If the datu wanted to avoid war, if he is in conflict with the datu from another village, they also convoked judges to act as arbiters. They also did this if the protagonist belonged to two different barangays. They also had laws which condemned to death a man of low birth who had insulted the wife or a daughter of the datu. This is also done if they are considered witches and the others of the same class. The datu condemned nobody to slavery unless he was smitted the death penalty. The witches were killed. Their accomplices and their children became slaves of the datu chieftains after he made some recompense to the injured person. All other offenses were punished by the fines of gold promptly. If not, they are punished by servitude to the person to whom they owe a debt until it was fully paid. The status of women during that time. Women in pre-colonial Philippine society had the right to inherit property, engage in trade and industry, and succeed to the chieftainship of the barangay in the absence of male hair. They also had the exclusive right to name their children. The men walked behind them as a sign of respect. Marriage customs during the pre-colonial. Men were in general monogamous, while their wives are called asawa, while concubines are called friends. In order to win the hand of his lady, the man has to show his patience and dedication to both the lady and her parents. Courtship usually begins with paninilbihan. If the man wins the trust of the parents, he does not immediately marry the woman, but he has to satisfy several conditions, such as to give a dowry or what we call bigay kaya, pay the panghihimuyat, pay the parents himaraw, bribe for the relatives called sambon, which is frequent practice among the zambals. Once he had settled all of the above requirements, he bring his parents to meet with the bride-to-be's parents to haggle and make the final decision or arrangement. This is called the pamamalae or pamamanhikan or pamumulungan. The wedding ceremonies vary depending on the status of the couple, but normally those from the upper class a go-between was employed. Weddings are officiated by the priestess or babayalan, and cook rice is then thrown on the couple after the wedding ceremony. In terms of politics, the government, unit of the government was the barangay, which consisted from 30 to 100 families. The term came from the Malay word balangay, meaning boat. Barangays were headed by chieftains called datu. The subjects served their chieftain during wars, voyages, planting, and harvest. And when his house needs to be built or repaired, they also paid tributes called buoys. Alliances among barangays were common, and these were formalized in a ritual called sanduguan. Conflicts between or among barangays were settled by violence. Those who win by force is always right. The chief or datu was the chief executive, the legislator, and the judge. He was also the supreme commander in times of war. Legislation. Before laws are made, the chieftain of datu consult with the council of elders who approve of his plan. They are not immediately enforced until the new legislation is announced to the village by the Umalahokan, who also explains the law to everyone. The laws were either customary, handed down from generation to generation orally, or written, promulgated from time to time as necessity arose, dealt with various subjects such as inheritance, property, property rights, divorce, usury, family relations, adoption, loans, etc. Those who found guilty of crimes were punished either by fine or by death. Some punishments can be considered as torture by modern standards. In terms of judicial process, disputes between individuals were settled by a court made up of the village chief and the council of elders between barangays, a board made of up of elders from neutral barangays acted as arbiter. Trial by ordeal. To determine the innocence of an accused, he is made to go through a number of ordeals, which he must pass. Examples include dipping one's hand in boiling water, holding a lighted candle that must not be extinguished, plunging into a water, a river, and staying underwater for as long as possible, chewing uncooked rice and spitting, and etc. Religion Religious beliefs 
pre-colonial Filipinos believe in the existence of a number of gods whom they worship and made offerings to according to rank. Example, Batalang May Kapal, which is our creator. In Diniale, God of Agriculture, Sidapa, God of Death, Balangaw, Rainbow God, Mandarangan, War God, Agni, Fire God, Lalahon, Goddess of Harvest, Siginarugan, God of Hell, Dian Masalanta, Goddess of Love. They also adored idols called Anitos or Diwatas to whom they made offerings. Some Anito were considered bad and they made offerings to them too in order to appease them or placate their anger. Priestesses such as the Babaylan or Bailana or Catalona acted as mediums to communicate with the spirits. They also showed respect for animals and plants like the crocodile, crow, tigmamanukin. Some trees were not cut because they were thought to be divine and are dwelling places of spirits. Diseases were thought to be caused by temper of the environmental spirits. Royal Practices and Beliefs Pre-colonial Filipinos venerated the dead by keeping alive their memory through the carving of idols of stone, gold or ivory called likha or larawan. Food, wine, and other things were also shared with the dead. The dead was placed in a wooden coffin, like this one. Okay. Mourning for a dead chief is called larao, and this was accompanied by certain prohibitions like engaging in petty quarrels, wars, carrying daggers with hilts in the normal position, singing in the boats, coming from the sea or river, and wearing loud clothes. The celebration held on the ninth night after the death of the person is called Pasiyam, in which a play called Tibao is staged to honor the dead. Relatives of the dead who was murdered would not end their mourning until they have exacted vengeance or balata. Divination or belief in magic charms Ancient Filipinos are quite superstitious and put much value into certain unexplained events or occurrences and the magic charms. The interpreted signs in nature like the flight of birds, the barking of dogs, the singing of lizards, and the like as good or bad omens depending on the circumstances. There were also the belief in the existence of aswang, mangkukulam, manggagaway, chanak, and the tikbalang. Amulets and charms were also used by ancients like an anting-anting, gayuma, odom, or tagabulag, wiga, or sagabe, and tagahupa. Content Presentation Analysis The contents of the writings of Fray Juan de Plasencia depicts the ancient or the pre-colonial life of the Filipinos before and upon the arrival of Spain as embodied in Plasencia's detailed narration of how life was in this period. Most of the important data and information had been found in most of the communities in the country, though it is always true that they are generally similar to one another. It just proves that these occurrences, beliefs, and events and practices had been existing long before the arrival of Spain. Hence, it is just appropriate to debunk the Western depiction of the islands as barbaric, uncivilized, and, un and uncultured when they arrived. The period of Islamization of the southern part of the country had also contributed much to the development of culture and some sort of civility in these places. Contribution and relevance of the document The document customs of the Tagalogs had contributed much to the understanding of the culture and heritage of the Filipinos. In a way, it has mainly provided us with significant and meaningful information to better appreciate and be proud of the cultural legacy from our forebears. It was able to instill in us a sense of oneness and nationhood that befits a rich culture that is of the Filipinos, and as a result would be able to move forward to progress hopefully with everyone supporting one another in the process. My learning experiences Fray Juan de Placentia's work had been a very useful tool for the understanding appreciation of the Filipino social, cultural, and political history. Because of its rich narrative, especially on mentioning the, um, the minutes of details in almost all aspects of life during the pre-colonial period, it had brought my vivid imagination to life as it gave me moment of depicting the events in my mind and provided opportunities for better awareness of my country's past at the same time applying this. So our sources and references. Credits for the photos. 
and thank you so much for listening.